Today, well, today is a special day. For today, we depart from the horrifically tone-deaf and goofy MapleStory quest lines of old. Instead, embarking on a wholesome adventure. A quest of the ages, if you will. Heroes will rise. Ultimately, monster cheeks will still be clapped. But at the heart of this story lies a tale as old as time. A testament to the unbreakable bonds formed by the unlikeliest of people. This is a tale of friendship. An epic six-part saga. This is Friend Story. What's going on, fellow Maplers? It's been a couple weeks, but we're back with a full seven-parter based on Friend Story starting today. Buckle up, strap in, suit up, wrap up, whoops, I mean, do whatever you have to do to prep your ears for Nexon's usual masterpiece storyline. We start out by accepting the quest Student from Another World to learn the character, um, Student, very creative Nexon, seems to be amidst an argument and has teleported his phone to someone who can help. And well, I'm not really up to the task, so that about wraps up the series. Make sure to be a real friend and fist bump that like and subscribe button. Thanks. Ah, I'm a sucker with a hero complex and you know I couldn't turn down Student, even if I wanted to. So, Student gets a magic dude to do his magic-y thing and teleports us to the closet house. Once I go in, I'm going to have to come out eventually. The Maple Story loves Simon twist that nobody saw coming. Before we go into the closet, we get a cutscene of the Cygnus Knights. My queen! My queen! My queen! Do you know the way? My queen, you look beautiful today. Cygnus recounts a dream she had of a world different from her own. One of wondrous machines and a great society that spans the globe. We get a little sneak peek of that other world. All right, Nexon, taking a page straight out of the Isekai handbook. I guess this came out right after peak popularity for Sword Art Online, so they thought, let's hop on that bandwagon. Yo, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make a few predictions about the tropes we see before I even dive into the later parts. First, without a doubt in my mind, I'm gonna have my own harem, for sure, with Cygnus being the main squeeze. Second, there has to be some kind of uncomfortable beach or onsen scene. If an anime-style plotline ever gets created without one of these, I'm certain the whole industry would implode on itself. Third, we're going to be the most standout, awkward, but overpowered nerd to ever grace this other world. It will be quite fun when these come true. Turns out the Cygnus of the other world recounts a similar dream, but this one of a world with dragons and magic, where she is- My queen! My theory? This wasn't a dream. She probably had some really strong 2D mushrooms. We cut away to student throwing a tantrum about his life at Shinzu International School. The only logical solution is for him to enter the closet. I'm getting deja vu. Now that I think about it, isn't this the introduction to the Chronicles of Narnia, the mushroom, the black mage, and the wardrobe? At least, I think that's the title. Ah, back to the present, Elwyn and student are still going at it in the closet house. We interject to find Elwyn is a self-proclaimed master of barriers. Come to find, he's not all that great. He made the rookie mistake of tinkering with the dimensional barrier, only to end up with a wild wormhole that dropped a wardrobe in his lab. Pfft, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that one. We learn this isn't Elwyn's first rodeo skirting with failure, and he's afraid of the repercussions from Grendel the really old, who might just park Elwyn's butt in one of the garbage planes of existence for a week. Must be the one that led to the current state of Maple Story, huh? To prevent that catastrophe, he requests we help him close the barrier and convince the goober that crossed over to return to the dusty corner of the movie theater snack counter where he belongs. Elwin warns us he's a bit infatuated with his 2D mushroom world, and who could blame him? Aren't we all? I feel like Nexon always has my back with these stories. I just made a goober joke, then Elwin goes on to call a student a nut job which at this point is not just a double, but rather a triple entendre. I'll let you ponder that third meaning. We talk to student and my mind is blown. Not only does he continue the nut joke, he says this is like one of his animes. I feel like I'm in the matrix here. Some omniscient game dev knew the jokes I would make and is sitting back licking their Cheeto dusted fingertips, smiling like Dr. Evil while doubling down on all of them. A little intimidated by what's to come, I trudge on by trying to convince Student to return to his world. I start with the most compelling argument I could think of and tell him, the food here is hot garbage at best. 
Apparently, he finds the orange mushroom and evil eye tail soup better than meatloaf. Why his go-to dish is meatloaf is far beyond me. So, I try a new tact. I told him the truth. Maplers nowadays are on that XP grind set. They don't have time for newbies. But like we all wish we could replicate, he's a cute noob. He's just happy someone will pay him to squish snails for a few mesos. Out of options, I try the last ditch effort to guilt trip him at the old wag of the finger telling him, won't your parents be worried sick? As you could guess, this didn't work. He crawled out of his parents' basement just to attend school, probably not too grateful for their help. Student begs to stay an extra few days. Elwin tells us someone has to go back and tries to make the very unconvincing argument that somehow replicating the prince and the pauper is a good idea. If you don't know that story, it's an old Mark Twain book about two identical twins who switch places. There's just one problem. He's a whiny prep school kid and I'm a pasty demon with cat ears and long blue hair. Ignoring this minor hiccup, Elwin decides it's a good idea, so off we go. Students suggest we visit the school uniform shop to resolve this conundrum. I'm sure that'll work. We check out the town and make our way across the bridge to Shiny Club for our shiny new uniform. Here, we find Hugh Head. Huge, 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 huge. That is a huge, 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 huge. I'm a huge fan of your mother. I actually love Nexon's stupid puns. They're everywhere in this game, too. Turns out, he's having a bit of a headache due to all the last minute uniform orders. Yikes. Should we tell him? Oh no, we're supposed to be undercover and the questions start rolling in. You're a transfer student? From where? Mars? You're either a cosplayer or completely insane walking around like that. Oh, no, 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 no. He's on to us. I feel like Kyle XY. You know, an alien. No belly button. Potentially from Mars. If you know that reference, you're an absolute legend. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, watch the one minute Kyle XY season one trailer. That gem is from the golden age of television when literally anything could air. Really trying to fit in, I ask him, hey, what's the Shinzu International School thing? Really driving home that I belong here mentality. Turns out it's a school for the rich, high profile students. <sighs> Time to find me a sugar mama. This question leaves him, you, me, everyone in existence wondering, how did I get into such a fine establishment? Oh God, he brings up the fact I'm from Mars again. Oh, uh, uh, I swear, I'm just an Elon fanboy. Doge to the moon, Twitter's better platform under your helm. I want to name my future children after robots. Clearly, Hughes just wants us to leave and gives us one of the ratty old uniforms in the back. Even though we are in a land of science and progress, apparently they have a bit of magic of their own. This special uniform is form-fitting and can fit over whatever you're wearing. We do a bit of sewing and, ah, uh, yes, true to his word, we definitely look like we belong now. I'm starting to think he has his eyes closed for a reason. He tells us it's a great fit. We're all set. He needs to go back to work on an absurd uniform and that we must know who it's for. A bit ominous, but whatever. All I can really think right now is his obsession with his head and the constant battle in mind to want to play the copyrighted music of Headstrong or Zombie right now. At least, we finished what we came for. Elwin gives us a call and provides the inside scoop on Shinzu International. Turns out, I didn't need to nearly blow my cover with Hugh. Also, this cheeky little rascal has absolutely no faith in us. He forced us into this situation to fix his mistake, and now I get the old tongue-in-cheek Noted. We make our way over to Shinsu International School. All right, I'm starting to take Elwin's side here. The first thing my character says is, ooh, maybe they have a quest for me. Ironically, to be fair with this series, I'm like that too. But that's besides the point. We are an undercover alien trying to fit in as a new transfer student. Stay on task. I try my best, but <sighs> my quest trance is broken with the spell of another kind. One, of true love. My dear Cygnus is in distress. Her handkerchief blew away. Oh no, a fate worse than the bottom circle of Dante's Inferno. But you know me, I'll happily reside in that second circle. It doesn't end there. I'm even more smitten to learn that she not only has money, she knows the value of it. She wants her handkerchief back. Not even skipping a beat, I introduced myself. Only problem is, I forgot to say anything and just stared at her. Oi, never give up. 
I persevere and slide in smooth as silk to hit her with a, you're so pretty. Yes, success, she said. Thanks, I guess. All right, so prediction one Completed. from earlier, already locked in. Cygnus is my main squeeze. Ugh, I knew it wouldn't be so easy. Chauffeur Kim steps in to try to break up what can only be described as love at first sight. But now's my chance to be the Romeo to her Juliet, completely forgetting I'm supposed to be low key and fitting in. I jump higher than the tree to pick up her handkerchief. <laughs> I swear, it's only a stuffy nose from allergies. It's not what you think. We return it and, ugh, she's happy, but she thinks I do CrossFit. My character clears that one up real quick. Don't know what you mean. Oh boy, if I had a face cam, you would see the color rushing to my cheeks. Cygnus tells us we're in really good shape, like superhuman or something. I brag about my D&D &D sesh, telling her I'm a big time hero back in my world, because clearly I wouldn't blow my cover yet again. Hook, line, and sinker. She takes the bait and rolls with the hero line. You know my work ain't cheap. I need to get paid. Give me your mesos. Her priorities are ass backwards. She thinks that's humble, which makes me wonder what she actually had in mind for my reward. I don't think about it too hard as she gives us her number to give her another laugh later. I just need one more to start that harem. 10 minutes into this quest and I'm already on a roll, locking in that main squeeze. Collection log slot completed. Chauffeur Kim butts in again and tries to rain on our parade, but my character gives the nastiest, most repulsive answer I have ever heard. Do her quests not give good XP? Ugh! I'm playing the game and my heart sank a little bit for Cygnus. I'd farm her quest for experience all day long and be happy for it too. Kim is equally disgusted by my character's comment. Now I'm starting to see how he founded his claims that I'm in it for the money and power and I hate those who have it. He says, I'll backstab her. Man's just trying to protect her. In continuation of the most savage replies of all time, my character retorts, I don't have the backstab skill. <laughs> Kim speeds off to seek out Aloe for that burn. Turns out I'm no hero. I'm really the villain of this story. Still plenty of time to come back from this, I guess. Let's try to retune this story a little bit and try out our luck with this whole school thing. Turns out Stan the Man is our teacher for today. The very cleverly named male students say hi to us. Trying to fit in, I introduce myself as the hero of the maple world. I know, I know, hold your applause. These kids, though, don't even know simple geography. They think the maple world is in Canada. <laughs> Losers. So I double down on fitting in by telling them I usually complete party quests or monster park runs for fun. I don't think I could have thought of a worse answer myself. I literally told them I do dailies for fun. Menial tasks that have abnormally good rewards to encourage you to do something that you otherwise wouldn't do in the first place. Invite me to your frat parties now. Make me the school president. I deserve it. Stan puts it aptly. Try not to bully them too much. All right, weirdo, take your seat. Our character knows we won't survive the boredom of school alone. I need to start fulfilling the true purpose of this quest. Make some friends. I play Maple Story. I know my people when I see them. So I talk to Francis, nerd among nerds. Although Mr. Fister over here is looking like a Chad, a mix of Danny DeVito and Johnny Bravo. But I stay in my lane. I ask Francis if he wants to be friends and surprise, surprise, he's thrilled by the offer. He's got a keen eye for spotting nerds, takes one to no one, am I right? And identifies us as a big MMO junkie. He's a bit of a model kick guy himself, but he knows his way around the internets. And I hope this man clears out his cash. That monstrosity would send you straight to Arkham Asylum. Please, never let this see the light of day. My character cannot get off this whole party quest thing. Francis breaks the fourth wall and describes Maple Story to us. This must be kind of mind shattering because for once, we do what we should have been doing this whole time and just smile and nod. Francis recounts an earthquake where he caught a glimpse of meteors falling from the sky. I need to men in black memory wipe him ASAP. He has me on camera, Terminator style dropping into his world. 
He's too close to the truth. He thinks there is an amazing secret behind this event, like an alien invasion or something. All right, damage control time. Can't memory wipe, so let's gaslight and outcast him as a conspiracy theorist. But he hasn't pieced the whole puzzle together yet. He offers to check it out together. Big mistake, bucko. You know what they say, keep your enemies close. Isn't that what friend story is all about? Johnny DeVito cuts in with his pompadour to tell Francis to go nerd out somewhere else. I'm a bit confused by the introduction because one of the caterpillars, some might call eyebrows, is trying to crawl off his face. However, he continues by kindly offering to teach us how to shove Francis into a locker. This does sound like a generous offer, and I'm a bit tempted, but he makes one big mistake that I just can't forgive. He tells me he needs a partner if he's gonna run this place. Now you listen here, if anything, you're going to be the Robin to my Batman, the Patrick to my Spongebob, the Morty to my Rick, the Troy to my Abed, the Scooby to my Doobie, or something like that. Danny Bravo doubles down saying this is the only way out if I don't want to receive the old swirly. I was even considering letting that comment slide if it didn't come down to this final statement. If nerds don't want to get beat, don't talk about dollies. Bro, they're action figures. Limited edition, one of a kind, sealed, never touched, on display for me and my mom to enjoy, all right? There's only one course of action now. Settle this out back at Fight Club. Throughout this whole interaction, we gain a little bit of empathy towards Francis's situation for our efforts. Although, he makes it really hard to back him comparing this situation to one of his animes. He warns us the new kid knows some street karate or something. Well, I'll have you know, I've trained, honed my body for years in the ancient art of slap fighting. One, two. I think better of myself for a second. I shouldn't use such a life-threatening powers on a mere child. I head around back to see what our friend has in mind. Yas, that's what, like, two friends at this point? Going super well so far. Before I arrive, we get a bit of insight into his true desires. He's looking to go around with the girly looking dude. And who could blame him? My character looks like a pansexual blue fairy. Apparently, I won't be so pretty when he's done with me. Yikes. I swear, he's just looking for a boyfriend. I sense a lot of pent up sexual tension. Fortunately, or unfortunately, it was a different type of tension. Mr. Fister turns around, takes a squat, and poops out a real troublemaker. And I have no qualms about slapping up monsters. So I pull out the Byakugan and go eight trigrams, 64 palms on this scrub, and send the monster packing. Mr. Fister becomes the fallen master, trying to spare what little dignity he has left from being unable to make it to the bathroom. <laughs> he tries to say he's still top dog, but seems more like he's a groundhogging to me. We leave him to wallow in it and try to clean himself up. Man needs some privacy. Elwyn has spot on timing. He senses a disturbance in the force, a poop that ruptured the ethereal connection between worlds. Well, he admits that it wasn't his keen eye for the brown guy, but rather Grendel the really old sixth sense for the dirty deed. We're teleported back to confront the old man who seems to be a hybrid of Master Roshi and Gandalf the Grey, as he's a wizard holding one of the seven legendary Dragon Balls. We give him a rundown to learn this isn't just another world, it's a parallel universe, full of the same people in the Maple World, leading different lives. He starts going off on some interstellar inception tangent about which world is real world. All I know is that it doesn't matter what world we're in. Cygnus will always be my main squeeze, and that's that. Grendel spells out the gravity of the situation. This means disaster for both worlds. It's too late to send student back to his world. The evil energies of the Maple World have already begun to affect the parallel universe. We remember back to the earthquake Francis talked about. For some reason, it's only now that I realize that this is actually just a meteor shower. There was no evidence of an earthquake. Remember, perfect, impeccable, no mistake quest lines. I bet you next time we just push the blame onto Francis, who got the two confused. Or possibly, I was wrong too. It wasn't meteors, but rather the seed of evil.
Regardless, Grendel needs us to resolve the issue. He tells us to continue acting the part of a student and utilize the help, or lack thereof, of Elwyn and the much more useful manipulation master, Lily. If I know anything about how to build strong friendships, it's definitely through manipulation and deceit. We talk to Lily and learn that Elwyn is just a straight goofball. He's accidentally used his barriers to, one, trap himself in a public toilet for three days, two, lock himself out of his house a couple times, three, now he's opened a barrier potentially dooming two worlds. That's top-notch goofball energy. Lily reiterates what Grendel told us about playing the part in the parallel world. My character says it all. I'll do what I can, but those people are really weird. She wishes us luck, and we complete the prologue earning the World Beyond the Closet achievement. Next time on Friend Story. A new student of fate? Yes, the new student of fate is an adorable little rumor I've heard going around. Who's that Pokemon? It's Jameson. <laughs>